Tech Sounds presents EduTrends. Welcome to the EduTrends uh, podcast and webcast brought to you by the Institute for the Future of Education. My name is Jose Pepe Escamilla. I'm Associate Director of the Institute for the Future of Education. And today's guest is Doug Lynch. Doug is Senior Fellow at USC's Rosier School of Education. Doug, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here and to chat with you. Thank you. So you were, uh, we were talking before we start this that you were, you have been working here like 35, 37 years uh, trying to disrupt education. You were the first, one of the first or first uh, uh, charter schools uh, doing online learning when no one believed that online learning worked. Uh, and you've been now you're doing a tech entrepreneurship in USC, Rosier, and other universities. And uh, how will you explain the, what is the reason that you've been doing this? So, as a, so I'm an economist, and um, you know what we know is that learning is a perfect good. When we get this right, it changes lives, and it's not just for the learner, but for her family, for the organization, for the community, for the. I mean, there's a bunch of research on that. Um, but unfortunately, for most people, they don't get the kind of education that we had. And so I spent my career as an access guy trying to bring education to people who don't have it. That's why I started one of the first charter schools and sort of why online. And I've done all kinds of crazy things that we could talk about if you want. But it's always been on the theme of figuring out ways to bring learning to those who don't have access to it. And it's generally less a technical problem than sort of an economic and sort of a cultural and political problem. And the reason I got involved in the entrepreneurial space is I probably spent the first third of my career uh, looking more like a typical academic administrator, which is you go to one project, you bet everything on that project having an impact. And what ends up happening is some of them have an impact, some of them don't have an impact but it's not scalable. And I know that sort of one of your big passions is actually scaling things. And what I love about the entrepreneurial world is that one, we get to make lots of bets. So, you know, with the program I have at USC, we touch more learners than the rest of USC. Seven million a year, that to me is, and we're doing it with no resources. I mean, so that's the beginning of scale. And it's by leveraging entrepreneurs because each one of those entrepreneurs can have part of a solution as opposed to saying there's only one way to do it and, um, and going that way. So it's why I uh, later on kind of moved from building things myself to trying helping lots of other people build things because it's a way of scaling much faster. So, um, but I do it because when we do this right, it changes lives, right? And that is, um, that's, that's fun and it's important. Very, very interesting. So what I, I have never asked myself uh, the why, when I was listening to you, I was thinking that maybe uh, I, I, I have some uh, similar thoughts about education as you do, but maybe something that motivates me is also that I am like a first generation in my house that goes to the university and my, my parents were to elementary school, only grade six, uh, with difficulties, no, and uh, seeing that um, I am an, like an example of the good things that have happened with education, and not everyone has access to that. Uh, it's yeah, something that, that motivates me. How how can I make more people be part of this? I I totally agree, and part of the challenge is that in a lot of places. It's either somebody extraordinary like you who was able to overcome. I mean, I can only imagine what it was like to be the first person. There, you, there's no path for you to go. You're, you're, you're cutting the path yourself, figuring it out. Um, and that feels to me really hard to do. And the problem is, is that only really exceptional people do it. And I think what we need to do is just make it easier 
so that more people can can do it. Uh, because if we do, again, it's a cycle of virtue. Everything's better off. There's no downside to having more people better educated, right? I mean, it would really, it would be good. And yet, when we look around, um, you know, there's not a lot of great learning out there. I mean, you know, in, in my country, United States, we've got some of the best universities and schools and a lot of ones that aren't particularly good. I'm sure that's true in Mexico and in other parts of the world, they really don't have a lot at all. Um, so that feels to me like something that collectively we got we to gotta, we gotta work on. In Latin America, um, uh, the number of people from every 100 people that enter higher education around 50% finish. No? One of the things that amazed me is that there is no like a, a general agreement in the community of uh, university uh, professors, leadership departments to commit to the success of 100% students that enter the university. I think that in, K in the K-12 space, there's a certain commitment to that, but not in higher ed. It's like a higher ed is a selection of the fittest, no? Uh, oh, I, I, I love this. I actually think it's worse than that. It's built on scarcity. So to be the best university in the world, at least in the U.S. rankings, you would want everybody to apply to you and you would accept nobody because that would mean that you are the hardest to get into. And a lot of universities, their production of learning is weeding people out. So what I mean by that, so like in my doctoral program, 30% finish with the argument that the 30% who finished, they could do it. What happened to that other 70%? And that was an elite, hard to get into doctoral program. So I think that it's, it's almost like it's a scarcity because we know that works for certain people. It just doesn't work for most people. Um, but it's a hugely inefficient model because we're just all those people who don't make it, what happens to them, right? So, um, but it's really funny because you play a lot around in the innovation of lifelong learning. And in some ways, the most innovative places are the ones working with the quote, worst learners, the ones who failed, who didn't get support in other places. And if you look at the most traditional places, they're the ones doing the least innovative stuff. So it just seems backwards in a way, right? Uh, I mean, I think tech's really interesting because it is elite and innovative, but there's not a lot of places like tech out there, right? The, there's a lot of institutions of higher education. Hopefully the curriculum has changed in the last hundred years, but the pedagogy hasn't changed at all. And how one becomes a professor hasn't changed. And in a lot of ways, how one becomes a student hasn't changed. And that's, that just seems to me insane. It's insane. You're right. So uh, in the work that you're doing with this um, um, helping other people change education, no? and that, that you say you have a, a group of uh, startups, or now enterprises, some of them, that are reaching, you say, 7 million people. How... How that you ensure that what they are doing is really impactful in terms of uh, learning or changing people's life? Uh. Um, well, we do it in two ways. Uh, the first one will seem self-evident, but I'm going to argue that it's one of the problems with the incubator accelerator space because most of the incubators and accelerators have to make money. So you pay to be part of the program. Sometimes you pay in equity. Sometimes you pay in sort of dollars or pesos, but you pay, which misaligns the incentives in a way, because what matters to the accelerators is finding the people who can pay the most or who can pay. Uh, so we've always been free. We take nothing. Um, and we've also always been virtual. Um, because the other thing that happens is most of the accelerators, at least in the U.S., require you to move to Silicon Valley or New York. And generally what we have found is the type of person who can move there is very young and has a lot of resources. And yet 
the more interesting entrepreneurs tend to be people in the field who have experience, who see a problem and develop a hypothesis, but they can't sort of move to sort of, you know, sort of to, 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 to LA or, or New York, and they don't have an extra $50,000 to pay for one of these programs. So as funny as it sounds, simply by changing the production of the, the system in such a way where we judge on the merit rather than on the economics, we get a bigger and more interesting pool of applicants. And then secondly, we focus, um, another thing I'll say about a lot of the accelerators, the way they're designed is again, largely to help the company get more money. So how do you do a pitch to get more money? We take a slightly different argument saying that if you focus on product and customer, everything else will follow. So we have a partnership with Digital Promise. We do a lot of work on efficacy, just, you know, what does your product do and how do you know that it does it? Maybe you haven't done a randomized controlled trial. Most startups can't, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't ignore all research. Um, and then, um, and then secondly, engage with customers to figure out what they really need and show them what you're doing and ask them if they think that would help solve a problem that they have. So again, it's a little bit backwards because of the economics of accelerators and, and incubators are largely predicated on, I'm paying a lot of money to go there. And so I want more money when I get out, which largely is put me on the circuit and put me in front of investors. And I think we're probably be Y Combinators for, but we're probably among the ed tech accelerators to have the best track record on the economics by not focusing on the economics. So the companies, you know, we have 95% of the companies that we've uh, mentored are still around, which is pretty good for startups. And they've raised over a hundred million dollars, but we don't do a lot of work on how to raise money. We do a lot more work on efficacy of product and understanding the market. And then the team, how do you sort of help the team be the right team with the argument that if you have all those things in place, when investors look at you, you're interesting and different than a lot of what they are. A lot of, they'll see a lot of very polished presentations, but there's no meat behind the, uh, the pitch. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's kind of, um, by focusing on the things that you and I as educators know they should focus on, but which a lot of programs don't because it's kind of cool to say, oh, I won a pitch competition and I got $50,000 and now an angel investor is giving me, and those are all interesting signals. But to me, a better signal is how many customers do you have who are coming back and buying your product again? Um, so, so it's, um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting program. Um, we also get more women and people of color, which is now kind of popular in the United States. It comes and goes. Um, we are not a program that focuses on women or people of color, but by simply opening it up, 85% of our founders are women or people of color. And, um, and again, just sort of, so it's very financially successful. It's very diverse. And I think it's because we just focus on things that we think as educators matter more. Which is, uh, which is uh, knowing, uh, like in general, I would say is, uh, people that have, um, you gather to a group of people that have more experience and are not willing to leave their hometowns, families or whatever, and afford the cost of going to the Silicon Valley or Los Angeles in this case, uh, which is very expensive for many people, but also focusing on, uh, the learning outcomes or the uh, impact, uh, in learning uh, of the technologies, uh, which I think is very interesting because very few, uh, incubators or accelerators as are based on evidence. No, of all that is also part of what we do here in IFE, uh, launch, which is our early stage accelerator, but by the way, yours is early stage also or later stage. Uh... So we are somewhat agnostic. So it's definitely early stage. Um, certainly no institutional investment. Sometimes it's more than an idea on paper. 
maybe they have a minimum viable product and maybe they have families and friends and maybe they have one customer. Okay. It's more or less the same that, 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 yeah. that we do. We, we, we don't take equity or charge anything, uh, for, for that. And we also focus on, on, um, on the impact or the, I would say it in another way on the value that we generate to the learner who is the end user of, uh, of the technology. But as you said, it's difficult for um, startups to have this uh, assessment of their solutions, impact measurement, or whatever. So how do you work with them to do those kind of things? Um, well, I, I suppose the short answer is we teach them. We teach them how to do it, and we show them that you know there's a hierarchy of evidence and the thing that frustrates me is folks go, I can't do a randomized controlled trial, which would be like a gold standard where you could really figure out whether it works or not. So I'm going to do nothing. And I'm not going to look at the research and I don't care if my idea is based in research or not. And one of the things that we say is even before you are, like when you're in the idea stage, you should be a scholar. You should study the market you know, the, the science behind the work to say like, oh, what I think I'm going to build is based on sound evidence in the same way an engineer would understand physics before they go build a bridge. And then as they progress, you, you know, we do things again with digital promise around logic models and just how to begin getting in the habit of baking evaluation into everything that you do. Um, and what's interesting, again, I think you all are an exemplar on this stuff, but investors are starting to say, oh, that's interesting. Actually, we would rather invest in companies that do things that work rather than not work. Um, but they're not necessarily equipped to evaluate um, whether something works or not. Um, so it's largely just teaching them and creating a culture where you're crazy to be an education entrepreneur anyway. If you were just getting in them for the money, go to FinTech or something, it's just easier. So you must be doing it because you see a problem that needs solving it. And you're right. Um, our entrepreneurs profile older, you know, they are maybe 35 to 40 as a public. We had a Nobel laureate a couple uh, years ago. Um, they see a problem, but the opportunity cost is higher for them. They can't just quit their day job. So you have to build support systems that allow them to grow that and then move it on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that you all do a lot of sort of training of your folks around sort of evidence too. I don't think anybody else is doing that. I think most it's largely, let's look at your pitch deck. How do you sound when you present? Are you dressed nicely? Do you have a compelling story? Um, and not really sort of, you know, what's the problem and what's the, what's, what's, what's the solution and does it work? One, um, one thing that you said that, uh, I, I want to go into more, um, uh, depth is, uh, what was the word that you say that you have a support network, uh, that you have to build for the startups? Is that what you said? Uh, yeah. So, so, you know, being an entrepreneur is a lonely lonely, uh, journey, particularly in education. Um, everybody's saying no to you. Universities, when you're trying to sell them are saying no, investors are saying no, but simply, I mean, in our program, I don't know if this happens in your program, we get a lot of tears where they're just tired. You know, somebody has been working on this for 10, 12 years. They, they think that it's helping. They just can't get, and they're exhausted and they have nobody to sort of help them and simply having a group of people who understand and then bring different technical expertise. So, you know, we partner with Cooley, we partner with Whiteboard, um, most of the venture capital firms, they all donate their time to us to sort of help. Um, but the, I think the big thing is simply they having each other and knowing that there's 14 other people in the cohort they can call on and say like, this has happened to me five times today. I have met Five, had five meetings and everybody said no, and I don't know what to do. And being able to just share those stories and talk about them and say, don't give up, 
Um, you know, most of the evidence is that most entrepreneurs give up too early. Um, and uh, you have to, I think it's Camus in The Absurd talked about the beauty of Sisyphus rolling the rock up the hill and the rock keeps falling down. But Sisyphus rolls the rock up the hill again and that there's beauty in doing that. And I think, you know, we have to encourage the entrepreneurs uh, to not be stupid, but to persist because it's hard. I mean, it's hard work. It, it, it reminds me of something that uh, our writing lab director, uh, Samira Hosseini, uh, the writing lab helps uh, professors uh, who are not from education uh, to uh, train them, uh, mentor them, and help them to do research and publish in educational, uh, in journals of the education or education of the discipline, not the teaching of the discipline. Q1 and Q2 journals are very hard to get into publications. So one of the feature things that she has is failure stories. It's uh, how to publish a paper uh, you get uh, rejected, rejected sometimes four or five times until you get it published. No, so it's also uh, uh, building resilience in uh, uh, <laughs> in publications. It's very different from being an entrepreneur, but... Uh, no, I... So I... I now for almost 30 years when I teach, I have an assignment called a failure resume. And I make people talk about their life through their failures rather than their successes. And again, I, I'll give you, I knew I had something with this where the first time I did it, this is sort of at Penn a long time ago, it was a Wharton student who was a CEO, very successful woman who got up and the first thing she said was, my husband left me to be a monk, which meant he'd rather be celibate and poor than married to me. And she realized in doing that exercise and reflecting on it, that that was what was driving all the work that she ha was doing. And so I do think this, you know, in our world, failures kind of see, you know, fail fast, like, all, but failing is hard and it's heartbreaking and it's frustrating. So going through this exercise of looking at it and dissecting it and even understanding what we're doing to contribute to, because oftentimes we're our own worst enemies. You know, yeah, um, I certainly in my career have been my own worst enemy. Um, so just understanding that is, should, so I like that assignment very much because it's both helping them reflect on what they're doing wrong to improve, but it's also dispositionally getting to sort of realize that like it's, that's part of the journey and I actually think when, you know, when we do these exercises, we see more about ourselves looking back on our failures than we do on our successes. It's painful, but, but it's interesting. Yes. I, I think that uh, you're, you're saying here things that are um, uh, more than just uh, the edtech field is something that we can apply to different areas of our life and particularly the personal, the personal areas uh, of our life. Uh, Sometimes we forgot that we are um, not divided in two. Not just uh, the, our work part and our personal side. Uh, we are everything is connected at the at the end. So very interesting reflection. Well, I mean, I don't want to embarrass you, but I think you're an exemplar of this. Um, you know, um, you're an exceptional person who could be doing different things, and yet you're doing this work. And I think there's something inside you that sort of says, that, I don't know whether it's the the parent story you uh, told or something else. But I think these sorts of things are what make us tick. You know, I, I have been sort of quite ill and you reflect on your life and you don't want your tombstone to say like, didn't two deals. Or, you know, it's really in the arc, you know, we want to do things that matter. Or, you know, and I think that we're a gift uh, or that we're given a gift being able to play with all these entrepreneurs. Because if we can help them, I mean, the impact is just... It's just immense, right? And how many, how many students do you think you've touched through all the companies that you supported, right? As opposed to as a teacher, you might touch 30 students and they will touch, you know, but like with this kind of stuff, it's really sort of, you know, like there's a little bit of Pepe and all of those things <laughs> out there all over the world. It's That's scaling. cool. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. So I, I, I think with getting uh, to the end of our talk, uh, I, I would like to ask you uh, some uh, advice maybe for people that are here and that like to uh, become uh, entrepreneurs. So my first, maybe two questions, no? 
my first question is, uh, first question is, where should they go? Uh, in what direction? What are the, uh, some people go over trends or over problems or over things. How can they find uh, something to be uh, working on? Uh, what's, uh, what's how, how do you uh, adjust your radar to find a, an interesting problem to try to solve it with, uh, with a startup? So, um, one, it's recognizing we all have this in us. Um, and also that we don't have to do this alone, right? That we can find groups of people to the image of Edison being in a lab all by himself. That's just a myth. There's a lot of people behind every sort of great innovation and to embrace that. And I guess it's tricky because I think there's a hundred different answers to that, but I'll give a philosophical one if I'm allowed to. We're, we've been quite philosophical here, but children... We all have a superpower and we've forgotten how to use it. So a little child knows how to ask for help. She reaches out her hands and say, help me. And it makes adults feel very uncomfortable and ugly to sort of say, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not sure. Will you help Pepe? You sort of know all this stuff about entrepreneurship. Will you help me? And of course, the irony in that is you're dying to help them. You, you know, most people want to give. But people get very uncomfortable asking for help. And so I think the fundamental dispositional thing they have to realize is that, you know, everybody can do this and ask for help. You want to, you know, people in the field in particular, if they see something that's a problem, chances are they're not the only person who's seeing that it's a problem. So start workshopping that and ask for help. Um, do you know the parable of stone soup where there's a hungry man? And he doesn't know what to do. He has, so he picks up a stone and he walks into a village and he talks about like, have you ever had stone soup? I've got the stone. And does anybody have any vegetables? And one person says, well, I've got some vegetables. Does anybody have any meat and want? And all of a sudden the whole village sort of cooks a meal. He had a stone. So it's, it's the playing with others. Again, it's all these things that we have uh, as children, the how to play, how to ask for help. Those sorts of things, I think, um, are critical and it makes us uncomfortable as professional adults to do those sorts of things. But I do think that is, is part of the secret sauce. That's a great answer. And the last one is where they can find more information about the work you do, the accelerator oh, program. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, you can find me at USC. Um, the accelerator is, uh, you know, listed there. They can, I'm happy to talk to anybody about any of these issues. And again, um, our program is free and open to anyone in the world. And we're, we're glad to talk to anybody who cares about, you know, changing the world. So, um, they should just reach out and ask for help and, you know, and they'll get a response. Great. Uh, so I, I, I think many people will reach out to you. That's great. Thank you for that. Thank you, Doug, for this interesting talk. And I'm sure that uh, our audience will also uh, love listening to this talk. It was very enlightening and well, I'm inspirational. A big, big fan of yours and just thank you for the opportunity to talk to your audience. So thanks. See you soon here in Monterey in January. I look forward to it. Ciao. For more information, visit observatory.tech.mx slash podcast and ife.tech.mx. A special thanks to Tecnológico de Monterrey, the Institute for the Future of Education, and the Tech Sounds team. Tech Sounds producer, Miguel Mejia. Editress producers, Esteban Venegas and Christian Igosa. Stay tuned and play Tech Sounds in your favorite podcast app for other great shows and content.